Welcome to First Baptist Church of Conway. We're so glad that you're joining us online for worship today. And while we're happy to provide this resource for you, we just want to encourage you that nothing can take the place of corporate worship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And so as you are able, I invite you to join us on Sundays at 10 a.m. for worship. And I look forward to seeing you as you do. So as I've told you before, my high school years, unlike these ladies and gentlemen who are up here today, were not the best. Uh, my entire high school career was exactly what parents do not want for their children. Um, I lacked the grades and general attitude to do much in high school, um, but there was one thing I was pretty good at, other than getting in trouble. It was working. I had a great work ethic from a very young age. I mean, my mama made sure I had a great work ethic. And you want to know how she did it? And look, this is going to shock some of you parents. I know, but just hang on. Just listen. She made me work, right? She made me do chores. She made me clean around the house. She made me go outside and do yard work with my stepfather. And I absolutely hated it, but this was not an option, she made me work. She made me helped out. And what I learned at a very young age is what I needed to do and what I wanted to do weren't always the same thing. And I had to work through that, and I had to learn how to work. And if I didn't work, guess what would happen? I'd be grounded. So if I wanted to go outside and I wanted to play and I wanted to hang out with my friends or I wanted to drive, I had to do work around the house. And the same way, if you want to eat as an adult, what do you got to do? Work. I know. Some of y'all are wondering what's going on. You didn't make your kids work. I'm just throwing it out there. And so for me, I had a lot of different jobs as a teenager. My very first job was at Arby's at 15. You want to make sure your kids are productive people, make them work fast food and clean the restrooms at fast food restaurants. They will learn very quickly why they need to get a college education. Very, very quickly, okay? And so that's what I did. I will confess, I did get fired for my first job. I know, none of y'all been fired before, I know. I threw a kid out of the drive through window. Evidently, you're not supposed to do things like that at work. And so I had a bunch of different jobs, from Arby's to Dairy Queen, uh, shoe stores, grocery stores, all of that type of stuff. I mean, I, I did it all. But I ended up working part-time at a car wash. You see, I was also an electrician during the time after school. I would go work as an electrician, but most construction jobs were shut down during the weekends, and I needed to make money because I actually had to pay for things, so I had to make money. And so on the weekends, I would work car wash. Yes, I had two jobs in high school. That was my life. And so I did that at the car wash, and it was at the car wash that I first met, the first time in my life, I met a great leader. His name was Kelly Pageant. He was the GM of the company who'd been brought in to take a successful company and turn it into successful companies to expand, to go larger, to do bigger things. And you see, Kelly, Kelly was the first person in my life that told me I had great potential. He was the first person who told me that I could become a manager, that I could become a leader, that I had these characteristics and this ability to do something greater with my life. I mean, he was the first person outside of my mama who believed in me. Now, mind you, what I heard every day in school was how I wasn't good enough, how I was just a troublemaker, how I, because I didn't fit in the standard model of education, that I would become nothing. Back then, teachers were a little bit more forceful probably than they are today. And how, for whatever reason, someone like me, who didn't want to sit at a desk for eight hours a day learning Algebra 2 and about Shakespeare, because I do not still want to learn about any of those things, that that then meant I could do nothing in the real world that everything was based off of that. And so in education, in my high school career, I lived exactly to what they thought of me. I lived right up to it. You think I'm a troublemaker? I'm going to live right into your expectations. You think I'm problematic? No problem. We're going to see how problematic I can be in this classroom. And I always met their expectation willingly. Now, you combine that with my dad's massive dad issues, right? Not knowing him growing up and just not being good enough and not um, people didn't like me. Like that was something built inside of me. But then this guy, Kelly, working at a car wash, said, man, 
you can do great things. At 16 years old, I had no idea what he meant. But guess what? I did everything in my power to live up to that man's expectations of me. Have you ever had someone speak into your life like that? Do you remember that first person who saw something inside of you, something that you didn't even know that was there? Do you remember the first person who said, you have some leadership potential, you have some experience, like there's something inside of you, you can do some pretty good thing. In fact, there's other options in your life than what you're currently doing. And I'm not talking about your parents, though if you had parents that did that for you, I'm happy for you. I'm talking about those people outside of that who inspired you, who spoke into your life and said that you can become something greater. You can do something pretty amazing. I hope you've had that and experienced it. But if not, it wouldn't surprise me either because great leaders aren't easy to find. In fact, great leaders are extremely rare. But the great thing about this is if you're sitting here today, if you're a Jesus follower, do you know you can become a great leader? Do you know you can inspire other people to be bigger or better and work for something outside of themselves? Because Jesus followers, Jesus followers make great leaders. You're like, what are you talking about leadership? Yeah. Do you know Jesus' followers make great leaders? Think about this. We follow the greatest leader that has ever lived. I mean, the greatest leader. If you believe in the divinity of Jesus, if you believe that he's from God, he's the son of God, then what you believe is he is the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the greatest leader, the one with all authority who walked this earth and teaches us how to live. And so you would lean in then to learn from him. And if you're not sure what to do with Jesus, if you're like, ah, I don't think he's really divine. I don't really the son of God. I think that stuff's kind of crazy. That's even better because then you have to explain how this man 2000 years ago started a movement with no empire, with no money, with no war, None of the stuff that people use today to build a movement. He started it 2,000 years ago without any political power, with any political aspirations or riches. He started this movement that has affected billions of people. I explain that because of his divinity, his divineness, him being the son of God. And if you're not sure about that, then you just have to go, wow. Talk about a leader. Talk about someone who inspired people. Talk about someone who started this movement that 2,000 years ago we're still talking about. Like, that's amazing. Jesus was amazing. History has proven he is the greatest leader to ever live, and he has produced some of the greatest leaders that have ever lived. I mean, think about it. you got this band of people under the Roman Empire in the middle of nowhere that started this movement and led this movement and took it globally without airplanes, without cars, without air conditioning, without computers. I mean, talk about leadership. Talk about inspiring people. Talk about a movement. Because Jesus' followers make great leaders. And he tells us how. And I bet if you've ever worked for a great leader, you've ever worked for a great company, I guarantee you this is what it was about. This was that thing. It's something that Jesus teaches. We're going to jump in and look at what he says about this. Mark 10, 32, he's talking to his disciples. It says, now they were on the way up to Jerusalem. This is Jesus and his disciples. And Jesus walking ahead of them. The disciples were filled with awe, and the people falling behind were overwhelmed with fear. Taking the 12 disciples aside, Jesus once more begin to describe everything that was about to happen to him. So Jesus is heading towards Jerusalem. He's heading towards the cross. He knows what's awaiting him. He's already told his disciples two times before this what he's going to face, what it's going to look like. And so far, up until this point, they haven't been really receptive to that. They haven't really understood the suffering that he keeps talking about or what his whole plans are. Remember, we saw a couple weeks ago when he told this to Peter. Peter rebuked Jesus for it. Peter's like, listen, Jesus, you're killing the movement. Nothing bad's going to happen to you. Stop. Like, that didn't work out well for Peter. Do you remember that? 
But so Jesus is pressing towards his goal. He's going to carry out his mission that he came for. And he lets them know a third time. He says, guys, listen, you haven't heard me before. Lean in. Here's what's about to happen. He says, listen, he said, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priest and to the teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him with the whip, and kill him. But after three days, he will rise again. He says, this is where we're going. This is where we're headed. This is what you're about to see. He's preparing them. He spends a ton of time preparing them for what's about to happen and getting them ready to lead after he's gone. He says, look, you're going to see all this. You're going to see it. It's going to be bad, but I'm going to come back to life on third day. And Jesus spoke in a ton of parables, and all we can assume is they thought this was another time because he drops this bomb on them, and here's what they do. It says, then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came over and spoke to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do us a favor. So imagine you're talking to your kids. You're like, listen, I'm going to die soon. They're like, yeah. Hey, can you do me something real quick? <laughs> they just ignore they just, it. goes over there. They're just like, hey, can you do something for us? We, we need you to do something. Can you do us a favor? And if we're too honest, let's be honest. How often have we read the Bible? We heard a sermon. We've done this thing. We heard this thing from the Lord. Or we read this verse that we know could impact us, and we just move right along, right? We just move right past. We're like, yeah, about that. Hey, Lord, I need something. Here's what I need. We just kind of overlook it. So they're just like us. Let's not judge too hard. They say, Lord, can you do something for us? Here's what they asked. It's super fun. He says, what is your request? He asked. They replied, when you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in the places of honor next to you. One on your right, the other on your left. Hey, Jesus, we hear you, but we know you're going to be in power. We know you're going places. We know you're going to be a big deal. So can you take us with you? Can we sit on left and right? Like, we want to be second and third in charge. I'm the oldest brother. You should pick me, right? These are brothers. Like, he should be third. Now, <laughs> Mark spares us the details to make this more applicable to our day and age, because I bet you thought this was new. Guess who actually asked this for them? It was their mama. No, you can read it in Matthew. Their mama, right? You thought bringing moms to interview was a new thing. Evidently, it's not. Their mama came and asked Jesus, hey, can you do this? And Mark's like, look, we're going to spare them the details. We're just going to say it was them. It's not a big deal. But like their mama asked for them. Can they sit on your left? Can you sit on the right? They're like, we know you're going to come to power. We know something amazing is happening. Can we be in charge with you? Can we be in charge? Can we get glory? Can we get honor? Jesus, can you do this for us? We want to be in positions of power. He says, you want to know where I'm going? You think you can do what I'm going to do? He says, you guys have no clue what you're asking. And the other disciples heard about this. Look what happens. Verse 41 says, when the 10 other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. They were furious. They were mad. The other disciples who also wanted power, wanted control, looking at Jesus, seeing what he can do, they found out these other two were trying to get ahead, and they're like, hey, what are you doing? I wanted to be second and third. Like, isn't there an application process? What are you doing? And come on, wouldn't you get upset? If you're one of the closest and someone else is trying to get ahead of you, you've never experienced that at work, have you? You've never experienced that in life, someone trying to get ahead, someone trying to get more than you? They're just being normal people. They're trying to get ahead, but these disciples were ambitious. They wanted to go places. James and John, they wanted to do big things, and we know they were ambitious. We know they're intense. In fact, it tells us about one time when they were traveling with Jesus. They were headed, and uh, they sent travelers, um, messengers to the Samaritan village, said, hey, we're going to the Samaritan village. Tell them Jesus is coming. So the messengers went ahead, told them Jesus was coming. Samaritan villagers said, nope, we don't want Jesus coming here. They're like, we don't want a part of Jesus. We know what he's doing. We, know he's we, we, we don't want any part of this Jesus thing. So James and John, they're like, oh yeah, you don't want Jesus? Look at what they ask. When James and John saw this, they said to Jesus, Lord, should we call down fire from heaven to burn them up? They're like, can we just destroy the village? Like we saw that stuff in the Old Testament. We saw how like that's possible, Lord. We just want to play with some fire. Can we call it down now? Like, let's do some superhuman, super awesome stuff. And Jesus, thankfully, he turned and rebuked them. Oh, go back. 
He turned and rebuked him. He's like, no, we're not calling down from fire from heaven, guys. Like, that's no way. But that's who these two are. They're ambitious. They're excited. They want to get ahead. So, Lord, should we call down fire? He's like, no. And in this moment, Jesus, we want to be in charge. We want to be in positions of power. And Jesus is like, all right, guys. So he calls the disciples together. He calls them all, and he says this. Verse 42. So Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers in this world lord over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. He's saying, You've seen how the Romans rule. They exercise leadership from a position of power. They exercise leadership from their title, from their job, from their armies, from whatever else, the threats. They're like, they're always worrying about power and who's in control, and you need to do their bidding. You ever seen that type of leadership? Someone exercising leadership because of their job title, because of their power, because of who they are, and you need to do what they want you to do? They lord over you. They're in charge. You're not. And of course you've seen it. Perhaps you do it. This is default human leadership. Looking out for me, and if I'm in charge, you are there to do what I need you to do. I'm in control. I'm the boss, so here's your orders. And that's lording over people, using people to serve your wants and your needs. And you're like, wait, that's a problem? Oh, it is. You're like, but that's what it means to be in charge. Jesus says, nope, not for Jesus followers. He says, but among you it will be, say that word with me, different. It will be different with you. That leadership you see in the world, that leadership you see in business, that leadership you see that you're used to, that you read about, that you go to conferences about, that's not the type of leadership you need to exercise as a Jesus follower. And he's going to explain what this looks like. But what we have to understand, I want to pause for a minute to understand that as Christians, leadership is an okay thing to talk about. In fact, Jesus developed a leadership culture. Jesus instructed his followers what leadership needs to look like if you're going to be a Jesus follower. As we talked about that movement he started, that movement he led, he built up, raised up leaders who then would go lead this thing throughout the entire world. But he says you have to be a different type of leader. And unfortunately, a lot of churches, a lot of churches, especially if you grew up in church, you've been around church, churches don't have a leadership culture. But we, I believe, firmly believe in leadership and that we, as a church, have to develop a leadership culture at First Baptist Church. But it's super hard, and here's why. Like, this is what's going on in churches. Leaders are driven by what could be and what should be. Right? Think about leadership. What could be and what should be. What we see down there, here's where we're going, here's what we need to do. Leaders are moving towards the future. They see things that other people can't see and rally people around, influence people to let's go do this thing. But churches generally focus on what used to be. Not what can be, but what used to be. And we spend our time back there. We think about what has been rather than what can be, and that's an anti-leadership culture. Thinking about the past, dwelling in the past, living in the past has nothing to do with the future or leadership. Leaders focus on the present, how the present can get us to where God is calling us to be. And so many churches are sitting around kicking sand like the Israelites in the desert because they don't want to lead, they don't want to move, they want to sit and think about what used to be. But Jesus followers... They made great leaders. Jesus followers took the gospel everywhere. Jesus followers were movement-oriented people, believing that the gospel was important, believing Jesus' message and what he did was life-changing and groundbreaking, and the entire world needed to know and understand about him. So Jesus followers, they're looking out and moving towards something greater, so he says, among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave to everyone else. And talk about a paradox. But this is where we get the idea of servant leadership. And it's understanding, you and me, understanding that in God's economy, things work very differently. Leaders are there to serve other people. 
You're there to serve the people under you. You're there for others. It's not your job for everybody to work for you, but it's your job to help and inspire and work for them. The world's economy, the leadership you've seen over and over, and perhaps you mimic, is where you're in charge, you're the boss, and everybody needs to do what I need them to do. Here's your orders, go. But in God's economy, it's very different. They're not focused on themselves. They're not focused on their wants and their needs or their position, but rather focusing on serving other people serving the people underneath of them. But the world doesn't work this way, does it? And you know this, your boss, think about it, or maybe not your current boss, maybe your current boss is awesome, okay? Maybe they're in the room, so we won't talk about them. But the bosses you've seen before, or perhaps the way you've led before. Well, what you're really worried about at work is you're worried about getting ahead and getting a good promotion. You're worried about climbing that corporate ladder. You need that good review. You need to appease the board. You need to appease whoever. Like, that's what you're focused on. You're focused on you, Your career, your job, your legacy, it's all about you. To use biblical words, what that's called is you were trying to gain honor and glory. That's the Bible words. You want to be glorified. You want it to be about you. So you use your position of power for, well, you. People do it all the time. But Jesus' followers, they don't use their power and authority for themselves. They use their power and authority to serve other people to help other people, to develop other people. Andy Stanley says it like this. He says, Jesus tells us to leverage our authority for the benefit of those under our authority. Leverage our authority for the benefit under, of those under our authority. Meaning if we're in charge, it's our job to look out for the people below us and help them. We start with the real needs of human beings, not an organization, Not something out there, not our needs, but the people we serve. And this doesn't come naturally, and it doesn't matter where you fall in an organizational chart, you can serve and help other people. You see, God's economy is very different. Very different than the world's economy. And as Jesus followers, we should take this, his leadership style into the marketplace, into the workplace every single day and let the world see there's something different about us. You see, how I saw this play out was with the car wash. Kelly wasn't the owner. He was the general manager of the organization, but the owner and the owners were there and they had their, well, their agendas. You see, people for the owners, we were a means to an end. The end goal was him building a great business, having multiple Um, multiple different branches, multiple different car washes. His goal was all of us were there to meet his needs of him being rich. Er, richer. He's already rich. I'm just letting you know. Richer. To do something. We were just things. And if we didn't work out right, if we didn't do the right thing, what happens to things? What do you do with things? You just dispose of things, don't you? You just get rid of things. They're not important. They're not people. I mean, after all, It's just a car wash. Who's changing the world through car washing? Nobody. Just letting you know, nobody. So people were just a means to an end, just used us. But Kelly, he modeled servant leadership in a very, very different way, which was very obvious in this organization. Whatever we needed to accomplish our goals, he was for us. He believed in us. He would inspire us. He would come down, right? He would deal with the owner for us so we didn't have to, but he paid attention to us and helped develop us. It wasn't about him. It was about making us be the best we could possibly be. And it takes humility to pull this kind of thing off. It takes humility where you don't actually believe you're more important than the other human beings you're leading and serving. It's understanding that you use your position of authority to help those under your authority rather than demand they follow your will and your expectations. You see, Kelly, he didn't think he was better than us. So he made us better by his authority and by his power. It was very different. You see, Jesus' followers, they don't pretend that business and personal aren't intertwined. You don't get a pass as a Jesus follower to say, well, it's just business. So I can do what I want. Nope, not as Jesus' followers. He's still the God of your business. He's still the God of your employees. Like, we compartmentalize to pretend that we don't have to follow Jesus in this area because, well, it's just just work. 
not personal. What are you talking? Of course, they're human beings. Of course, it's personal. They're human beings created in the image of God. And so I ask, do you see people as a means to an end, or are they there to do your bidding for your success? Do you see your title and your company and your leadership as a means to an end, or the people the point? And here's my point. I said that many times. Do you use people to achieve your goals, or do you use your company, your organization, your title to help better people's lives? Is your business and your title more important than people? And see, for me in my field, I don't know about your field, but in my field, this is super easy to see. Like, let me help you understand it with the church. I believe everything we do here is for the glory of God and helping people mature as Jesus followers. Meaning everything we want to do, we want to help life change happen. We want to help you grow closer to Jesus Christ. Like th- we want to leverage everything we have as a church to help actual human beings because we believe that people are the point. Honestly, we believe that. But many churches unintentionally, probably unintentionally, people aren't the point. Well, the building's the point. Or the traditions are the point. Or the name's the point. The organization's the point. Right? Or the numbers of people in the pews are the point. The end goal is all this other stuff, but it shouldn't be. We should leverage everything we have to help human beings. And the rest of it, who cares? Jesus died for people, human beings, and they matter more than things. People are the point. In God's kingdom, we leverage everything for people. And here's why it works. It's so simple. Think about this for your organization. If you believe that your boss is for themselves, if you believe that your boss is for themselves, who are you going to look out for? Yourself. Why? Because no one else is. If no one else is looking out for you, you're going to look out for you. Why wouldn't you? If your boss is not looking out for you, but they're looking out for themselves, you're like, hey, that's what we do here. I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to look out for me, and then everybody's going to look out for themselves, and we wonder why that organization doesn't work, and the people don't like each other, and they fight all the time. They're trying to backstab each other. But if I believe my boss is for me, it frees me to focus on others. If everybody's boss, or everybody's board, or everybody's organization, or everybody's manager, if everybody's leader knew that the person above them was for them, then that frees up your leader to look out for others. It starts at the top. If I know you're for me, I don't got to worry about me because you're looking out for me. I can look out for them and I can take care of them. And the cycle continues. If you know you're taken care of, you're not worried about it. Then it frees you up to worry about other people. And you think, listen, there's no way I could ever get anything done at that type of attitude, looking out, trying to help other people. There's no way that would actually work. We lean in and we go to verse 45. Jesus says, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and give his life as a ransom for many. For many. So God's economy isn't based on power and prestige and control. God's economy is based on service and giving. Jesus came to give. He died on a bloody cross for you and me. Jesus, as the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, came and took responsibility for our problem. He didn't push off our problem. He didn't ignore our problem. He didn't say our problem didn't exist. He didn't blame us for our problem, although we understand we're at fault for it. What did he do with the problem? He took responsibility. As the leader, he owned it. He said, I'll deal with it. I'm not worried about blaming you. We already know your fault, but I'm going to deal with the consequences. I'm going to step in your place. I'm going to substitute myself for what you deserve. Come on, leaders. How many of you want to make sure everybody gets what they deserve? You want to judge. You want to lash out. You're quick to just write people up. Where Jesus stepped in the place and said, no, 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 no. I'll take care of it. I'll, I'll, I'll die for it. I'll fix it. You see, This idea of servant leadership is by far the most powerful leadership you'll ever come across. Because if there was a better form, Jesus would have used it. But he didn't. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others. To use his power and his authority for the benefit of of us. Of you and me. 
He was already glorified. He already had it all. But he leveraged it so we could know him. You see, Jesus died for people. And so you and me, we should leverage, well, you leverage your authority for the benefit of those under your authority. You say, okay, I got it. Jesus leaders are supposed to be different, but what does this look like in real life? What do I actually do in real life to help people? How can I leverage my authority for the benefit of other people? What does that look like? It's real simple. Watch this. Why don't you ask the people you lead? Why don't you just ask them this? How can I help? How can I help you? What do you need from me? How can I use my position and my power and my authority to benefit you? What are your needs? What are your concerns? I mean, when was the last time your boss actually asked you that? About you. Not what I need you to do for me to get done. They ask you that all the time. But how can I help you? What are your goals? What are your dreams? What do you need? What can I do that not benefits me, not benefits my title, not benefits my my paycheck or my bonus? What can I do that will just benefit you? I mean, when was the last time you asked your subordinates how you can help them achieve their goals and serve them? Or do you look at your employees as people that serve you? With Jesus, it's the opposite. When was the last time you took a young punk kid and inspired them like me? When was the last time you just spoke life into somebody at your job and just really tried to look out for them and help them and develop them, not because you had to, but because you wanted to? You wanted to bring something better out of them. When was the last time you asked that other department, how can we help you? Imagine if different departments actually talked about helping each other and came together and served each other. Imagine if like, people got along at work. Wouldn't that be an amazing thing? If we're all like, hey, you need help? I got you covered. Like, I'm going to help you right now. I got you covered. No problem. I know it's not my job. Let me help you anyways. We don't see that all the time. Jesus' followers need to be different. And listen, even if you're not in leadership, it doesn't matter. You can still say, how can I help? How can I serve? Because that's what Jesus' followers do. That's what he told us to do. It's rather than taking, and listen, I'm just going to let you know up front, if you use this model like Jesus to serve other people, you're going to have to understand you're not going to always get the credit. Yes, you're going to be taken advantage of. But it's okay. We do it anyways. Because as followers, Jesus, he tells us to lead a bit different. And listen, if you want to learn more about this, if you're trying to understand what servant leadership is, or you love leadership stuff, on June 4th, we have a class right after church. That's going to dive all in the different aspects of servant leadership. Lunch is even provided. I know, it's pretty amazing. We're pretty great, aren't we as a church? We are. Come out. Be a part of it. Learn more about what this looks like. And I want to end with this real quick. The, lo- the world does not need more people fighting for prestige and power to build their brand and push their agenda. The world doesn't need more people looking out for themselves and their career. The world needs more Jesus followers serving and leveraging their authority for the benefit of other people. And listen, perhaps you won't change the world. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. But you do have the opportunity to help change the life of a human being around you. Kelly Pageant did it for me. Who knows? It's just it's one guy, 16, at a car wash. You just said, this is just a car wash, isn't a big deal. At 16, said, hey, you can do something greater. I believed him. You can do that for other people. John, the guy who wanted to cast down fire from heaven and obliterate a town, maybe you've wanted to do that. The guy who wanted to be in this position of power ended up being this guy who is so infatuated with the love of Jesus Christ here at the Gospel of John. And when you read that book, your mind would be blown to understand he wanted to obliterate towns because all he talks about is love. Or that he wanted power because all he talks about is love. Like Jesus is powerful and can change you and me. So let's inspire that in other people. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. And I pray and ask you to help us become kingdom leaders, people who've been transformed daily into the image of Christ. And Lord, help us become the leaders that Jesus have asked. 
Help us see how we can help other people with our authority and our power for their benefit. Rather than always pushing our agenda and our goals, Father, help us focus on people because they're the point. Lord, this week, help us see people how you see them. Help us see people as those we can inspire, as we can speak life into, that we can truly give ourselves to help them achieve their goals and their dreams for your purpose in this light. Lord, we thank you for those great leaders who you've put in our lives. And Father, help us be great leaders who can impact the lives of other people, all in the name of Jesus Christ. And for your glory, we pray. Jesus.